Uh, I mentioned to you Sunday, you know, I came back from Israel uh, about a week ago, and uh, really a life-changing experience. It was an incredible trip. My second trip, I went 20 years ago. And there's a number of things that happened, a number of really spiritual moments. Uh, One was on the Sea of Galilee. I was there. Uh, By the way, hello, Facebook friends. I hope you're doing great. Hey, if you have any uh, questions or anything, you can text either Pastor Aaron or Pat tonight, and they'll respond to your questions. So uh, just as the service is going on, it's great to have you. And uh, we appreciate our, not virtual, what's the right word, our... uh, Online, online church community, man, because uh, you're, you're part of our church, and we're just glad to have you. Uh, and we're here for you, as a matter of fact. So we were sitting there, and, and there's just a lot of things uh, about Israel, but we were on the Sea of Galilee, uh, the place where Jesus fed the 5,000, another place where he met with Peter and, and had that moment where he said, Peter, feed my f- sheep. And for those of you who don't know, the reason I'm in ministry is because I had an epiphany. I had a, a moment uh, reading through John one year, when I was about 25, and I got to that, that passage, and it was just like, you know, lightning exploded and thunder struck, and the world kind of came roaring to an end, and it's like, I want you to go feed my sheep. And I'm like, well, I'm an engineer. What the heck does that mean? I, 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 you know, really, I had, a, I had a moment, and it was like, I truly didn't know what that meant, and I, I just didn't know what it meant. And I, mean, I spent another, you know, seven, eight years trying to figure it out until God opened the right door, and then spent another 10 years trying to figure it out, and then eventually ended up going to seminary and, and becoming a pastor. But it was, it was the beginning of a journey, and so it was strange to actually be at the place where, where God spoke to Peter, and God, you know, that was recorded in the scriptures, and later God spoke to me. And that, was, that was very surreal for me. Uh, it was a very surreal experience. There was another experience on the Sea of Galilee. It was on a Sunday morning. We'd gone out on a boat, and we were worshiping God, and we had a pastor from the Central Valley in California who was doing a wonderful uh, nugget or, or you know, chapel service, whatever you want to call it there. And while we were there, they had told us that there had been a confrontation uh, where somebody from Iran had sent a drone over to Israel and violated Israeli airspace, a helicopter gunship blew it out of the air, uh, knocked it down, but th- th- it was a provocation, and so the Israelis don't, don't ignore provocations. They always respond to every provocation. It's, it's one of their, their defense policies. And so they'd sent in uh, a set of fighters to take out uh, radar-controlled missile bases in Syria that were Iranian missile bases. And they told us that, and we're sitting on the Sea of Galilee, and you, you simply hear this sound. You hear... Boom, 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 boom. And I'm like, and the guy, what's that? I go, those are explosions. Uh, I grew up uh, working in coal mines and rock quarries. My dad was a consultant. I knew what explosives sounded like. Those were explosions. And you could hear them 20 or 30 miles away. And, and you know, the Israelis just went on about business. They just went on about life. And, and which brings me to what I'm sharing tonight. I'm, I'm sharing tonight uh, about overcoming opposition and enemies. Uh, Israel has fought six major conflicts, if I got the history correct, since their inception in 1948. They've won every one of them, not just won them, they've won them handily. Uh, They have been basically in a state of DEFCON 3, their entire existence is DEFCON 3. Uh, they, They are surrounded by numerous people who wish they weren't there. And yet somehow they overcome by, by God's grace and God's power, but also but by their own dedication, certain things that they do. And so tonight, uh, I, I want to share you know, what I learned in Israel about myself and in an encounter church and how we can overcome in our personal lives and in our, our church family's life the obstacles that the enemy is going to throw against us. And so I want to begin with, with the promises of God, because everything in our faith begins with a promise of God. Now, somewhere about 1800 B.C., plus or minus, there was this guy living in uh, Iraq, that, or Iran, basically, that, uh, that had a word from God. God comes to him in Genesis 12. His name's Abram, and eventually becomes Abraham. And the Lord says to Abram, he says, Leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you, And curse those who treat you with contempt. That's the New Living Translation. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. That's an amazing promise. And over the next 500 years, you see God bring that to fruition. You see the nation of Israel emerge out of uh, the the life of one family, of 70 people who relocate to to, Israel. to Egypt and are preserved from this famine who become this great nation of multitudes within 400 years and they, they migrate, they fall, you know, but God, despite their failures, his grace is there for them. He leads them into the Trump promised land and they take over and they thrive and then they fall back 
And they thrive, and they fall back, and they thrive, and they fall back. And there's this repetitive period until, until the nation is basically done away with. And yet God comes in in the book of Ezekiel in the 36th chapter, and I'm not going to go there tonight, but he comes in and he makes a prophetic promise about 600 B.C., you know, approximately 1,000, 1,200 years after Abraham's promise. And he says, look, I know you failed. I know that, that the first kingdom wasn't, you know, the fulfillment of everything we promised it would be, but that's okay because my promise is eternal, and I'm going to do some great things in your nation. You just have to hang around and wait. So fast forward, <laughs> I love that term, 2,600 years. <laughs> okay, go back. 2,600 years of waiting. And you have the creation of the modern state of Israel in 1948. Now, which brings us to the first point about history and life is, and you can put this on the, the big screen, is that truth is often a matter of perspective and how you interpret the facts. Now, here are the facts. The nation of Israel, that area, after the fall of, of the kingdom of Judah, you know, basically was conquered back and forth a number of different times. Various people had it, you know, the Medes, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, etc., etc. From about 1500 to about 19, you know, 20, it was controlled by the Ottoman Turks. It was part of the Turkish Empire, the Ottoman Empire. Well, what happened in 1920, you know, 1918? The Turks lost the First World War. They were, they were allied with Germany and, and uh, they lost the battle, okay? So as a reparation, England, which was basically had a protectorate in Egypt, assumed ownership of all of that area of the, of the, of the you know, Israel, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, all of that area, became part of the British Empire. And they held on to it till the end of the Second World War, at which point they decided, along with the United Nations, to gift part of that territory, about you know, a third of current-day Israel, if you want to look at it, to the Jews and said, look, there is no nation on earth where these people, the Jewish people, can you know, be in their own country, they can have their own rules, they can live according to their own laws, they can be Jewish. Well, this is our country, we're going to take this never, little narrow slit, we're going to give it to them, and Israel declares independence, and the very next day, five nations invade <laughs> Seriously, next day, five nations invade. There was five, 600,000 Jews. There was somewhere around 20 million or more on the other side. And guess who won? Israel, Israel wins, which shocked everybody. But they won, and they, they expanded their territory. And they've been through all those wars since then. And that brings me to this point of view that, that, that from the British standpoint, from the United Nations standpoint, from the United States standpoint, and from my standpoint as a pastor and a follower of Christ, I think the Britons were following the prophecy of Ezekiel 36. I think they were doing God's will. Now, if you're Palestinian, you probably don't think so because they gave away territory. Now, to be clear, the territory that the British gave them was not territory the Palestinians were living in, it was territory where the Jewish people were living in. The reason that that territory expanded is the, the Palestinians and everybody else invaded Israel. It's a matter of perspective. So when you get into a conflict, when you get into a battle, you got to know from the bottom of your heart whose side are you on and who are you going to listen to. Are you going to listen to the voice of God and God telling you his promises? and God telling you that you're his child and there's an inheritance for you, or are you going to listen to the side of the enemies of God who say that, you know, hey, you're a liar and a cheat and a thief, and how dare you call yourself a pastor? And all of those, that was a joke. Somebody's supposed to laugh there. So, you know, you're, you're having those things. Whose side are you going to listen to? It's a matter of point of view. And you're going to have to pick a side and say, that's my side, and that's where I'm going to listen to. Now, the facts are in, without dispute. It's the interpretation of the facts that often get into a conflict in our soul. And, and we see you know, things that happen. You re remember the story of the young man Joseph who was sold into slavery. And he goes down to Egypt and he goes through all kinds of trials. And eventually, though, he prospers, becomes second in command of, of the nation of Egypt. His brothers come down. Uh, you know, they're very embarrassed eventually because of reconciliation. And Ju you know, Joseph looks at him and says, you intended it for evil. That's a fact. God intended it for good. That's also a fact. So I'm going to get God's point of view. Did good come out of my captivity? Absolutely. Did I save my family because I was a slave? Absolutely. Did this, all of these negative things that happened to me result in glory and honor to God and a blessing to my family? Absolutely. So whose side am I going to listen to? I'm going to listen to God's side. 
And I'm not going to, I don't care what your motives were. I care what the results were. So decide whose voice you're going to listen to and decide what point of view you're going to take. And let's be Jesus people. Let's be God people. Let's get God's point of view because I guarantee you that's how God sees Israel. All right? All right, let's go to the second thing I learned while I was there. Talking about overcoming. You can't do what's popular with everyone and fulfill God's vision for your future. There are always a whole bunch of well-intended and then sometimes not so well-intended people who are going to tell you that what you're doing is wrong. Can I get an amen from somebody? Amen. I mean, there are people within churches who, who, who you know, just don't want to go with what God is doing in that church. And it always surprises me because, you know, that, that why would you create a conflict? You know, there's people in schools. I sit on the school board at our charter school, or at least I will for another three months. And, you know, there's always a family that go to the school, it's an optional school, you don't have to go to the school, that complain about how the school is run. And all I can do is, after the first couple of times, when you realize that the school's not going to change to go in the direction you want it to, why do you continue to send your kids there? I mean, I don't, I don't get it. So, so what they do is, is they, they, they create conflict. So the school has a choice. They can either do the mission the school is dedicated to, or they can try to make these parents happy. That make sense? Well, and, and you can't do that. You can't accomplish both things. All you can do is be faithful to what God has called you to do. Amen. Yeah, that's all you can do. And the way this gentleman explained it to me, he said, you know, we don't hate anybody. We're tolerant of everybody. Uh, people have full rights of citizenship in our nation. Uh, you know, only 75% of Israeli citizens are Jewish. Did you know that? 25% or some other ethic. But the truth of the matter is, we can't let 7 million, you know, Muslims into our country and have a Jewish state anymore. It just doesn't work that way. They, it, we won't have a Jewish country. And so, the, so, the, so they, they, they have to be able to do what they believe they need to do in order to support Israel. Now, this is not a sermon about Israel. This is a a sermon about how we can learn from Israel in our life. So my question to you is, who is telling you something to do that is contrary to what God has told you to do? And why are you listening to them? Now, maybe they love you and maybe they care about you, but if they love you and care about you, they're kind of like Peter and Jesus when he, he looked at him and said, oh Lord, you don't need to go to the cross. And Jesus replies, what? Get thee behind me. Because you do not care about the things of God, even though you love me, Peter, even though you care about me, Peter, but you don't understand what God wants to do. You haven't been with me in my prayer closet. You haven't heard from the Holy Spirit when I have been praying and he told me that this day is going to come when I'm going to have to go to Golgotha and I'm going to have to lay my life down. There is a vision that I have for redeeming my people and it requires me to die. So in order to be Joseph to my generation, if I could say it that way, I'm going to have to go through some tough times, and so I can't please you. Even though you love me, I've got to please God. It's the same conflict that Jesus had in, in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Gethsemane is a really cool place to visit. It's not very large, but you could, you could just put yourself there. I was there. And, and beautiful church that's been erected there. There's a beautiful church erected everywhere in Israel. But, but you can just see Jesus struggling, saying, Not my will, but yours be done. And how many times do we want to go with what will make us popular or what will make us, you know, people will say, oh, I'm so happy that you made that decision. I'm so glad you did that. And yet we know in our heart it's not what God wants. And we've got to do what God wants. So you can't make people happy. You've got to make God happy. That's the second thing I learned. Third thing I want to talk about is perseverance pays off. In Habakkuk 2.3, it says this, and whenever somebody's going through a difficult season, it just doesn't, it doesn't ever seem to end. I think pastors always bring this verse out, but it, it's still true. The vision is for a future time. It describes the end, and it will be fulfilled. Now, it's interesting when it says it describes the end, it doesn't describe all the process leading up to the end. Have you ever noticed that? It just says, I've got this picture for you. You're going to step into the promised land. I'm going to... I'm gonna, make you into a great nation. I'm going to bless you and make you famous. You're going to be a blessing to others. He didn't tell him that there was like 3,000 years of history between that promise and the fulfillment of that promise. And, and what you've got to do is persevere. You've got to persevere. You're going to go through battles. You cannot get overcome. We visited the city of, of Megiddo, actually the Tell of Megiddo. It's a, it's a hill that's been created out of uh, ruins that have been built on top of each other. Megiddo, for those of you who don't know, you're familiar with the word Armageddon? 
you know, you know, where the Battle of Armageddon. Megiddo is kind of also in the Valley of Armageddon where the whole battle is going to be fought. Well, we're in these ruins, the top layer of ruins. There's 23 cities underneath that city that they've excavated so far. Because this has been a city that's in the middle of the plains. It was in a cross section. So what has happened is somebody builds a city. That city gets conquered. That city goes into ruin. And they've been, they build a new city on the ruins of the old city. There's been 23 cities built on top of that hill. And, and so you sit there and you go, what the heck is with that? It's that you've got to keep building. Uh, okay, if you lose a battle and the city gets destroyed and you've got to start over again, you build on the ruins that were there before. I mean, that's what you got to do. you got to keep rebuilding and rebuilding and rebuilding because the promise is for a future. God doesn't necessarily tell us all of the process it takes to get to the promise. But I'll tell you, perseverance pays off. When you look at the nation of Israel today, and you look at the, the history, and I, I actually did a little research because I just think this is interesting. I went back and studied you know, you know, the number of Jews in Israel and, and all of this stuff. and they, they were down at one point like 500 years ago to 5,000 Jews living there. There's, there's been Jewish people in Israel continually since the beginning. But, but between persecutions and killings and deportations and the, the diaspora and all of this stuff, there's always been this Jewish community there. And, and it's just been there no matter what happened. And, you know, and they just kept persevering. They kept persevering. They kept persevering. Persevering. Uh, there was a time in the, the 1500s when this, this Russian czar decided he wanted to kill Jews. So he killed 100,000 Jews. And yeah, I, I didn't even know that. I found out about it. And so a bunch of Jews decided Russia wasn't a good place to live. So they, they kind of left. There was a, another czar in the 1800s, 1880s, that uh, just basically expelled a bunch of Jewish people. And where'd they go? They went to Israel. And so, so you began to see, you know, this community began to grow little by little by little by little until the 20th century when it began to grow and grow and grow and grow exponentially. You know, but, but the reason it, it was able to grow is there was always this, this core people and they just had to be perseverant. You, you know, the city of Tel Aviv is interesting to me. You know, we visited Tel Aviv. And did you know the land for Tel Aviv was purchased by the Rothschild family? You guys know the Rothschild, Baron Rothschild? Very, very wealthy uh, French uh, banker, uh, prominent Jewish family. I mean, he basically bought a bunch of vacant uh, uh, seashore land that nobody wanted. There was Joppa, which was the historic, you know, seaport. And so the Rothschilds went in and paid the, the, the Turks, the Ottomans at the time, a ridiculous amount of money for worthless seaside scrap land. And Turk said, hey, if you're dumb enough to pay us that much money, there you go. And the Jews went there, and they, they began to, to plant, and they began to, to, to do things. Uh, part of the land they purchased was swamp land. They tell the story. They said, you know, we've got all this swamp land. We can't grow anything. And what they did is they imported eucalyptus trees. And eucalyptus trees drink like five gallons of water a day. And so in all the swamp land, they, they just planted, you know, tens of thousands of eucalyptus trees, which drained the swamp. Okay, which I, again, perseverance. And so now that's some of the most fertile, you know, the fertile uh, agricultural land in the world. They get two and three, sometimes four crops out of it because it's sunny all the time. And, and it's, it's, so they've turned what was junk into something that's amazingly fruitful but because they were perseverance. They realized the vision was for a future. That's where they were going to get. Between there, where they were and where they had to get, there's a whole lot of steps of obedience that you've got to walk through. I want to tell you, God has given you some promises. If you will get into your prayer closet, if you will get into a place of communion with God, God will absolutely talk to you about your future. I'm not making that up. He will. He will talk to you about your future. He will talk to you about what's going to happen. He'll talk to you about these things. But between where you are and, and where that is, there's going to be a lot of things. There's going to be a lot of rebuilding. There's going to be a lot of persevering. There's going to be a lot of making a decision to, to follow the right voice. And that's the third thing, that perseverance pays off. Which brings us to the fourth thing. And, and this, this is uh, kind of interesting. Sometimes everyone is against you. You learn that in Israel. There's times everybody's against the Jews. But it doesn't matter if you don't turn against yourself. You know, the, in the history of the Jewish people, they've been persecuted by the Egyptians, the Persians, the Greeks, every, 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 every neighbor they have ever had. They've never had a neighbor that liked them. Uh, the Romans, the Turks, the Russians, the Catholic Church, the Protestant Church, and most recently the Germans. But after every season of persecution, they have always experienced a season of what can only be described as supernatural increase. They've, I mean, every single time. It's insane. You, you, you have this time where they go through this incredible you know, 
horrible, devastating experience, and on the backside, they just blossom and thrive. I mean, it's just crazy. It's crazy that, that one people should go through all that. For those of you who may not know, today, February 28th, is, is, the, is the holiday of Purim. Anybody know what Purim is? Okay, per, Esther, we celebrate Esther. Uh, if you read the book of Esther, it's, it's a time when Jewish people all over the world read the book of Esther, which was a story of a, of a king who uh, had a, an advisor named Haman who got jealous of the Jewish people, decided the best way to deal with his jealousy was have them put all to death. It seemed you know, damn perfectly reasonable. And there was a man named Mordecai who was you know, a, an advisor as well, but he had a niece who had become one of the king's consorts, kind of one of his concubines or wives. And, and he you know, went to her and said, that, you know, you've got influence, you're going to have to step up. And uh, she says, if I step up, they're going to kill me with the rest of you. He says, well, don't think you're going to get by. You need to have some courage, and you need to go forth and save your people, which she did. It's a very famous story, and they celebrate it, and they make you know, cookies to celebrate. These are called Haman's hats. Can I show the picture up there? Yeah, 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 those are Haman's hats. You didn't know that. Those are Haman's hat. Seriously, I'm not making that up. The Jewish people bake those and they eat Haman's hat. Uh, and they give gifts to the poor and it's, it's what they do on Purim. But it wasn't just Esther's story. It was the story of people who didn't turn against each other. Esther didn't turn against each other. I, I love like the last verse in the book of Esther. It's a 10th chapter. And, and it says this, that Mordecai the Jew became the prime minister with authority next to that of King Xerxes himself. He was very great amongst the Jews, who held him in high esteem because he continued to work for the good of his people and to speak up for the welfare of all their descendants. The point of this is in the slide that I want you to put up, it says this, they succeed even today because they are united, they being the Jewish people, and despite their differences, they work for the common good. 90% of Jewish people support Israel. They, they have a deal, liberal, conservative, observant, non-observant, atheist, but culturally Jewish. They support Israel. They have these huge internal fights. They have beautiful internal fights. You know, they have people protesting in the streets. They, they have all of the things a free society should have. They, are, you know, they, they can be, you know, you're crazy, I think you're right. You, you know, picture the stereotypical Jewish people shouting at each other across a room. They have all of that until they're attacked. And then everybody quits fighting and they turn and defend themselves in mass. If you're a young man or woman and you're about 22 years old and you go out looking for a job, they're going to ask you what university you went to. They're going to ask you what you studied. They're going to ask you about your grades. And then they're going to ask you, did you serve in the army? They're going to ask, and there are literally bunches of companies that you didn't serve in the army? Oh, that's good, man. We don't want you. Because, you know something, we're only looking for people. You know, I don't care about whether you go to a temple. We don't care about any of that. But are you for us? Are you willing to do your part? Are you, are you a Jewish person who's willing to put Israel ahead of your own safety, ahead of your own thing? Are you willing to do that? And so how does that apply to our life? Well, a house decided, a divided against itself cannot stand. A home divided against itself cannot stand. A church divided against itself cannot stand. A company divided by itself. Okay? If you're a part of anything, whether it's a school, a family, a church, you have got to realize that if you're going to overcome your enemies, you can't spend half your time fighting each other. You're going to have to fight the enemy. You have got an adversary. His name is Satan. He is seeking whom he may destroy. He is trying his best to stop you from succeeding in God's will for your life. He is tempting you to do things that you shouldn't do and you know you shouldn't do it. He is lying to you on a daily basis to get you to believe something about yourself or others that isn't true. He gets you to question the integrity of God. It's one of his favorite things is to get you to question God's integrity and his love for you. He's causing people to get stirred up against you. Satan is over there causing people to dislike you just because you're you. Just because you're you. The devil is speaking into people's ears. Pat, when Pat is walking through a grocery store, the devil is talking to the lady at the banana counter going, he's an evil man right there. He's an evil man right there. He's bald. Look at him. He's got shifty little eyes. You know, he looks just like the devil. He does. I, I, I know what the devil looks like. He looks like Pastor Pat or Reese. You know, you know what I'm saying? The devil is whispering in people's eyes just to cause you a problem. But what you have to realize is the greater one is in you. 
And God is causing even your enemies to be at peace with you when you are pleasing to him. God is causing truth to come in. And what does truth do? It dispels darkness. It dispels lies. You have got to decide if you want to spend your time fighting your family and fighting other believers and fighting you know, the vision of God or whether you're going to set aside our personal agendas and do what's best for the, for the, for the whole. Do you know why the government in Washington doesn't function? Because people aren't willing to do what's best for the whole. Everybody's got their own little agenda. Got this guy's got an agenda, this guy's got an agenda, this guy's got an agenda, this guy's got an agenda. And everybody cares about their agenda, but nobody cares about the country. Well, I, I, I just, I'm reading a book right now, what, what believers can do to, to change politics. And one of the primary things is we've got to begin to be the people who are willing to do what's best for the country. What's best for the country? And we have to do what's best for the church. We have to do what's best for our families. We have to do what's best for the school, whatever we're a part of. We've got to do what's best. That's why Israel wins its wars, is they fight unified. They're not divided. You need to be in unity with the believers who God has put into your life. So we've talked about four things. So we've we've talked about the fact that if we're going to overcome our enemies... Uh, we've got to begin to, to understand that truth is a matter of perspective, and we have to listen to the right voices in our lives. We've talked about the fact that we're not going to overcome our enemies by capitulation, by, by just simply trying to do what's popular and right, and, well, we just don't want, to, we don't want any conflicts in our lives. Well, we're going to have conflicts in our life because we're going to have to pick a side and say, this is our side. We're going to have to realize that perseverance pays off, that if we quit, if we only rebuild 22 times, we're not going to finish the race. If we have to rebuild 23 times, we rebuild 23 times. If we have to rebuild 53 times, we rebuild 53 times. We rebuild until we win. And we've got to realize that sometimes everyone is against you, but we only lose if we turn against ourselves. And if we turn against ourselves, we can't stand. Which brings us to the fifth point and the last thing that I really want to share. If we're going to overcome our enemies, we're going to have to use the right weapons. Israel's a funny place. They've got F-16s, they got tanks, they've got, they got an amazing uh, arms. They, they, they create most of their own weapons with the exception of their fighter jets, and even now they've got their own aircraft capacity. The little country of 8 million people, and it, it's just, an, it, you know, really, it's unbelievable what you see there. It really is. It's like, really? You do all this yourself? Yeah, we do all this ourselves. They're not dependent on anybody else. They build their own rifles, their own tanks, their own jeeps, their own, you know, heli- attack helicopters. They do all of that internally, and Aaron's nodding at me because he, he's a weapons collector kind of a guy. And, I mean, Israelis build cool stuff. And for a country that size, that's shocking. But, but you need more than the best guns. In Luke 6, 27 to 31, it says this. But to you who are willing to listen, and this is Jesus preaching, I say this, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, offer the other cheek also. If someone demands your coat, offer your shirt also. Give to anyone who asks. And when things are taken away from you, don't try to get them back. Do to others as you would like them to do to you. And what's Jesus really saying here? He said that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. You guys remember all the, the weapons, you know, we put on the what? <laughs> The shield of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, sword of the spirit. You guys remember all this? Okay. That, that, that we put on all the armor of the Lord. What we really are putting on is love. In the end, we're not going to overcome our enemies because we're, we're tougher, we're better soldiers, we can fight better, we can scrap better. We're going to overcome them through love. We're going to love our enemies into, hell, into heaven. We're going to, as, as they often say, we're going to love the hell out of them. And it, seriously, we're going to love the hell out of them. And, and if we're willing to do that, there is no force in heaven or earth that can stop the will of God from becoming a reality. And eventually, what Isaiah prophesied is going to happen, that they will beat their swords into plowshares, and the lion will lay down with the lamb. And it will happen because suddenly the love of God that's poured out through us to all of the enemies of Israel or the enemies of God's will in our lives 
If we maintain our integrity, if we live as Christ lived amongst his enemies, then the will of God will happen. I just was playing with numbers. We had a presentation in Israel from a Jewish Christian, and uh, eth ethnically Jewish, theologically Christian. And he said when, they, when his family moved to Israel, there were 25 Christians. It was like 1952. That's it. There's now about somewhere just under 20,000 Jewish believers, uh, ethnically Jewish, theologically Christian, if you understand. I wanna, there's some, don't want to debate that. So they've had a pretty incredible 300-time multiplication. They kind of went like 300-fold in 50 years. And if that same rate, which is honestly out of 7 million people, that, that's a pretty small percentage, 20,000 out of 7 million. But I want you to understand that if the same growth rate continues going forward in the next 50 years, within about 75 years, all of, it, Jew, all of Israel will be Christian. Just going to tell you that. So, and there's a prophecy in the New Testament that says all of Israel will, will be saved. And really, if, if the conversion rates that have been going on since Israel was founded were to continue, we're, within, we're less than 100 years away from all of Israel becoming Christian. Which is kind of bizarre to think about, actually. If you, you know, I'm going like, well, this stuff's happening before our eyes. And, and we have to realize that, that it's the love of the church for the Jews that will bring the Jews in. It's not telling them that they're wrong. It's the, it's the love of the church for Muslims that will bring them in. And in your life and the oppositions that you're going through and the fights that you're going through, if you lose love for your fellow man, you will never win. You will never win. You can stay in unity. You can do all the other things I talked about. But our weapons are not carnal, but they are powerful. So here's what I want us to do. I want to invite the worship team to come back up. There's a song I asked them to take out of the worship set in the morning, uh, or the first part, and put into the back. And I want us to take some time at the end of this worship, or in this sermon, to, to spend time in the presence of God. And, it's, you know, and, and, and this is a song about you know, no longer slaves. And, and the reality is that, that, that at some point in our lives, we have to wake up and realize that we're no longer slaves. And yes, we may have people who want to put us back into slavery, but they're not going to make it. Because God is in us. And so at the end of this song, we're going to come up and we're going to invite you. If you're just going through a difficult battle in your life, if you're facing a lot of opposition, if you're not sure what the future is to be, if you just feel like you're fighting and there's nobody on your side, we're going to invite you to come forward. And we're going to invite you to have an encounter with the presence of God. And we're going to let you, let, invite you to experience the infilling of the power of the Lord. So just like Gideon, who got down to 300 guys. And I was at Gideon's well. I was at the well where they, where, where they did the separation, where they, they drank up the thing. I got some cool pictures if you want to see them. God is going to fill us with his spirit, and we're going to do great and mighty things. Let's worship.
child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child Praise God. If you're in the middle of a fight and you're saying, God, I'm going to win this with your help, I want you just to come out of your chairs. Just come down front and say, God, just touch me. Touch me right now. I want an anointing for victory. I want an anointing like Gideon. I want an anointing like Joseph. I want to be like the Jewish soldiers of 20... 19 God who are going to be fighting somebody but they're going to win they're going to win they're going to win just come on down front and kind of scoot in this way scoot to the center if you would just scoot to the center come on down front people just come on down front just come on down front God I thank you I thank you I thank you Holy Spirit Holy Spirit Holy Spirit you're just beginning to pour out on these folks you're beginning to anoint them they're becoming new people God new people new people they are no longer the same they're no longer the same God they're no longer the same they're no longer the same, Father, in Jesus' name. Daniel, just sing us through that one last time, man. Just sing it through. Real soft. I am a child. Just sing it with him. God. God. No longer. I'm no longer slave to fear. Oh, come on. But I am a child of God. No longer. Come on. Jesus, I'm no longer a slave to fear, but I am a child of 
God. Come on, Lord. I'm no longer slave to fear. Yes, Lord. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. Judah, Aaron, or Pat, if you get a word, just hop up, let me know. I feel like what the Lord is saying is that you've got to quit judging your future by your past. You see yourself and you see all of your inadequacies and you see all your issues and all your brokenness. and how You're like Gideon in, in that threshing floor. You said, how in the world can God use me? And God says, you've got to stop that. It isn't about you. It isn't about you. If it was up to you, you'd be dead already. It's my grace that's going to carry you through. It's my grace that's going to bring you victory. I'm going to defeat your enemies because it glorifies me to do so. You just need to walk in love, stay in unity, keep persevering, stop listening to the wrong voice, and be a blessing. Be a blessing. Be a blessing. Be a blessing. Your greatest weapon is to be a blessing and to keep trusting Him and just move. Daniel, you or Nikki have anything in the spirit? Either of you got anything? Good. Tony, anything? Frida, you got something? No, you just want to pray? All right. You know, there's victory ahead, brothers and sisters. I don't say that to be religious. I mean that you're my brothers and sisters. We're family. That's who we are. We're family. We're brothers and sisters. We care about each other, man. I want you to win. I'm, I'm, your, I'm on the stands, you know, cheering you on. Give him the ball. Give him the ball. You know, that's, that's who I am, man. We're brothers and sisters. And we got to love each other. And we got to be there for each other. And when everybody else turns their back on you, man, we're going to be there. Because that's what family does. You got something, bud? Yeah, man. Well, you had that phone out. I wasn't sure, man. <laughs> no, it was good. I was just recording what you're saying because it's just good. It's good. It really is true. Yeah, I just... <laughs> okay, this may sound cheesy. Let's just grab the person next to us. Like, grab the person. Grab their hand. <laughs> I was hoping you knew what we meant there. Yeah. It's grab, the, grab the hand next okay. to you. And um, I just feel specifically... Pray for the person to your right for a moment. Pray for the breakthrough that you're wanting in your life. Pray that they have it in their life. Be a blessing. And if there's not somebody to your right, just, just look to the person that is to your right and pray for them. Uh. Yes, Lord. Breakthroughs. Breakthroughs. Winners, God. Breakthroughs. Winners. Where it looks like there is no hope, where it looks like, where it looks like the time has passed, where, where the time has run out for that certain dream, that certain vision, we just speak life. We speak life and newness. Lord, if it's time to step into the new season, give boldness to step into the new season. The new season. Thank the you, next Father. step. Amen. Amen. We just speak life, yeah. Amen. Just where the enemy has tried to come in and bring lies and Amen. words of death, words of, uh, of uh, you're finished, words of, of uh, yeah, just discouragement. We just speak life. Life for, life for my family right now in Jesus' name. Life. Amen. We speak life, fullness of life, abundance of life, in Jesus' name. Yeah, Amen. chains fall off now. We just speak in Jesus' name. Chains fall off now. Get off of the brothers and sisters now, in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, come, flow in this room right now. Holy Spirit, 
Now pay, uh, pray for the person to your left. <laughs> pray for the person to your left. Bless them. Come on. Amen. Amen. Come on. Praise God. Praise God. You know, we're going to need to go gather our kids, but, you know, uh, our ministry teams are going to be up here in a few minutes. I want to leave you with this thought. And Frida may correct me. I cannot remember an incident in the I certainly know the nation, modern nation of Israel has ever, they've never won a war they should have in the natural. Uh, okay, every war they've ever won, they've been outnumbered, outgunned, out whatever. You know, they, they shouldn't win their wars, but they've never lost one. You can tell because they're still there. <laughs> you know, because the next war they lose will be the last war they lose. But in, even in the Bible, they, they never should have won their wars. They were always the underdog. They were always the underdog. Yet it was God moving through them, and I believe it's still God moving through them. And so you need to encourage yourself that, that you need, you know, your, your victory is not going to come because you're smarter or, or bolder or whatever. It's going to become because God is moving through you. And so let the weak say what? I am strong. That's how we're going to win. We love you. Our ministry teams will be here. If you need healing, if, you just, if your relationship with God is not what it should be, and you just say, hey, man, I just want to make a, a fresh communion or dedication of my life to God, they're up here with you. I want to encourage you to sign up for our water baptism class uh, that's going to be coming on Sunday. I think it's 11 o'clock, right, Pat? Yes, so it's 11 o'clock. And so he's at the information center. But sign up for that, man. Baptism is a great, great, great spiritual part. We love you, man. Play us home, buddy. All right?